Hi. <clears throat> Hey, everybody. You want to go here, or should we go here? Please. <laughs> Both chairs. Here we go. Let's All go right. here. Let's go here. How's everyone doing? Thanks for coming, you guys. Yeah, Thank you. thanks for having us. So uh, we have a, an amazing, can you hear me OK over there? Yep. Yeah, OK, good. You guys are, um, have a very distinctive place in European history at the moment. Your biggest m and deal of the year. Um, which is PayPal buying iSettle. Um, but it's a very funny one, because you guys filed for an IPO. And then nine days later, boom. <laughs> so um, can you take us into back to what happened there? What, why did you, what, what happened, Jacob? That's a good question. Uh, like you said, we, were, you know, we had been planning for that IPO for a, almost a, a year. And then you guys ruined it. <laughs> no, but uh, honestly, so, so we have been planning for that. But eventually, roughly, you know, we'd, we've been talking to, to PayPal over the years. Yeah. And uh, we've obviously had sort of business discussions. But uh, come close to the IPO, we start to have more sort of in-depth discussions and meeting with yeah. Bill and also uh, the CEO, Dan Schulman. We, we realized that, you know, the visions are so very much aligned and, and combining forces from, from the ISIL perspective would kind of give us a fast track to reach our vision. So it kind of all made sense. I guess it helped that the IPO would have valued you guys at about a billion. Yep. PayPal doubled it for <laughs> <laughs> 2.2. There's, <laughs> there's, there's a whole art form to uh, IPO crashing. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, as Jacob said, is, um, you know, we're extremely excited about it. Um, you know, uh, having joined PayPal as an entrepreneur myself, um, yeah. you know, with Braintree and Venmo, um, you know, number one, just as Jacob was sharing, alignment on what we want to do for small businesses around the world. Yeah. Uh, you know, we serve 20 million plus businesses today, um, but when you think about sort of in-store mobile payments, bringing more of those small businesses around the world into the digital economy, we think there's a huge opportunity around that. And uh, you know, Jacob and the iZettle team have done a fantastic job with that. You know, 12 markets, you look at some of the other players in the space, have not really been able to uh, go as far internationally as what uh, Jacob and the team have done. And so we felt like that really fits with you know, our ambitions at PayPal, that we think these are capabilities that businesses around the world should have access to. So I think um, you know, uh, a lot of great alignment around that. And then you know, as an entrepreneur, you know, we've really built up a team of entrepreneurs at PayPal yep. over the last uh, five years. And so having Jacob, his co-founder Magnus, and the, and the team come in, uh, we think really adds to a great entrepreneurial family that we have in, inside of PayPal now. So I, I don't really, what, what's weird to me is that you had been, I, I'd been told also, you guys had been talking for a long time before this happened. But what was it? That, did his filing for the IPO wake you up or what was the <laughs> why, why did you wait for them to do the IPO before making offer or were you already talking to them it, it, it's certainly something we've been thinking about for a long time okay. I think the so we didn't do it because the IPO was happening but I think it's one of those um, you know made the joke about uh, you know IPO crashing like wedding crashing it's sort of like that moment at the wedding where it's uh, speak now or forever hold your peace like I, I think it's, it's not uh, that you couldn't have done it post IPO yeah. But the conversation we had is that, well, hey, we think this makes a lot of sense. If there's going to be a time, it's you know, much better to do it pre-IPO versus post-IPO because the complexity goes up. Um, and so certainly that um, we thought about that complication. But you know, we felt like these, you know, uh, uh, what Jacob and the team have been building, we felt like was something that we wanted as part of the family for a while. But certainly that notion of like, do you do it pre-IPO or post-IPO? Certainly yeah. less complicated to do it pre-IPO than on the other side. Yeah. Now, I know that I said um, part of it was that you guys didn't have much of an overlap. Um, so there's a very complimentary thing. And iZettle has done quite well as a startup. And obviously, PayPal is PayPal. But that's kind of slightly bitten you guys now, because the competition authorities are investigating the deal. Is that right? Are you going to be, what, what's, can you give us a little update on where that's going? Sure. I mean, the, the CMA in the UK, so there's one market, you know, the, the yeah. deal's closed. Um, so the deal's closed. Uh, but the CMA in the UK, uh, you know, we're working productively with them, uh, you know, to make sure that there's comfort, that what we're doing is, you know, adding to choice for, for businesses, 
you know, helpful to competition in the market. Um, and we're very confident that's the case. I mean, if you, uh, you look at the payments market broadly, uh, you know, as, as much as you know, PayPal has, has grown, we're still a very small piece of the overall payments market. And you know, what we're doing with iZettle, uh, we think is bringing a lot of great choice into the market and bringing a lot of great competition into the market is one of the things that we loved about what Jacob and the team are doing is that you know, there's uh, you know, a lot of, uh, I would say, entrenched players in the payment space when you go to markets around the world. There's been a lack of choice, and I think what we're doing together brings more choice to that. I don't know, Jacob, if you comment on that. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of interesting to see how this, sort of where, where we are now, especially given where, where we started eight years ago, going into the market to, to really sort of give the opportunity to small businesses to, to get access to, to the tools that we offer. I mean, at that time, sort of the UK was really an oligopoly sort of dominated by the banks, and we offered sort of our services. So, so it's interesting to, to see, but uh, we'll get there. Yep. Yeah, I mean, just anecdotally, I, I, I can tell you that there's been a real shift. There was a long time where you couldn't pay with cards um, in quite a lot of places. You had to use cash, which is fine, but can be quite inconvenient. Um, you know, there's just a huge swathe of merchants who just weren't taking cards, um, who are now. For my saddle, but others too. You know, PayPal has a pretty extensive business mm -hmm. there too, as you know, so. Um, so now, both of you have really interesting backgrounds as entrepreneurs, of course. Um, now you're part of a big, um, big, Behemoth, a, a, lot, a giant in payments, um, a giant, a, yeah. a friendly giant, <laughs> yeah. a friendly giant in payments. Uh, now, what, I, what, what, what do you think about the kind of opportunities for smaller startups? Like, where are the opportunities in payments now? Do you think, um, or do you think that we are in a stage of consolidation where you have to be bigger? You can take that first, Jacob. I think uh, looking at Europe, obviously, sort of the European and, and US and Asian landscapes are very different. But uh, I'd say if you look at Europe with what's happening with PSD2 and bank to bank yep. payments and things, we see a lot of, sort of innovation in that area. Um, and uh, looking at Asia, I mean, the, the entire sort of ecosystem is so much more, I would say, advanced compared to, to uh, in the Western world. So, uh, uh, you know. We, we see new companies emerging everywhere. I'm not really sure what it's like in the US, but I yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, the same. For, from my perspective, I, I think it's a very long way from being at a place where you have to be big to succeed. In fact, quite the opposite. Um, you know, I've done five startups going all the way back to the late 90s before FinTech was a term, uh, yeah. when I used to have to ex you know, explain to people that you, know, you could actually do technology in the world of finance. Um, now there it, is no Fin without FinTech. Yeah, that, that's right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, now, you know, the amount of innovation happening in the world of FinTech is 100x what I think it was a decade ago. And, and so I think you know, it's quite the opposite. There's actually way more innovation happening, and certainly we feel like you know, we're contributing a lot to that, um, but we're also partnering a bunch on that. We, you know, we want to be an enabler of others who are innovating as well. It's one of the major shifts in what we've done at PayPal over the last five years is really opened up the platform at PayPal to say, mm -hmm. we want to be a great enabler of others that are innovating in the space and, and, and the people that want to go build and create can use our capabilities on our platform to do more of that. So, you know, we see a huge opportunity in that. Uh, and, and the great thing about it, as Jacob was mentioning, it's a global phenomenon. I think that's the other major shift over the last 10 years or so is that um, you, know, you don't have to be close to capital uh, to, to go innovate now. The, the cost of entrance has come down tremendously with cloud-based computing and great distribution platforms like social and mobile. And so there's innovation happening all over the world. This is a great example of that. Like what an amazing place with so many uh, you know, great tech companies. And, and so I think that's a, a, a really interesting phenomenon as well, that just how global the, the, uh, the phenomenon has become. But I think what's also in, uh, exciting is that now it's, you know, innovation in payments is one thing, but it's really what we're look, sort of looking at doing together. It's building on top of payments and yeah. building sort of all the sort of complementing services for, you know, in our case, for small businesses and see how that can really sort of transform the situation for small businesses around the world and then eventually also for, 
for states and, and people. So I think that that's really what excites me. Payments is still sort of core infrastructure, and that will be changing and will always be part of what we do. But it's everything that we build on top that, that kind of excites. I feel like one thing I've seen a lot of when I think about like new companies in fintech, it's been a lot of um, apps to do sort of, for example, mobile banking um, for people, but it's a lot of me too stuff. Um, do you think we may be in a period where the most innovation is happening behind the scenes? Or do you think there's still something left to do for, for the actual recipient, whether it's a business or consumer? I mean, Braintree, you know, you guys completely changed the landscape with peer-to-peer -peer payments. I mean, mm -hmm. a massive thing that you did with Venmo, um, which I think is, you know, we're still, everyone has, cop has copied that now. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I settle obviously with the, with the dongle and, and changing it. But is there something, do you think there is still uncharted territory at that end of the market? Or do you think it's more about, as you said, creating a platform to enable more transactions and things? Well, I, I think, you know, Let's start with you know uh, mobile point of sale that, that you know Izettle's pursuing. You know as you mentioned, you know in, in markets that Izettle has entered, uh, many of those markets like small businesses were taking cash only, right? And yeah. I think if you look around the world, there are many many markets that still look that way. And I think that's one of the things that we're most excited about uh, with Jacob and the team joining is that you know they have you know, really found a way to localize and expand into new markets really quickly, 12 markets so far, many more to go, uh, we hope, uh, that we'll do together. But I think the other thing is, you know, while yes, anytime you see something succeed, you'll see a lot of, you know, sort of players want to go emulate that. At the same time, you know, we talk about, for example, like underserved consumers. And like in the US market, there's 30 million plus people who don't even have basic financial services uh, in the US market. But then when you look around the world, there are billions of people that don't even have access to basic financial services like yeah. a checking account or yeah. a debit or credit card. And as you look at the rise of the digital economy, you know, if you don't have basic financial services like a debit or credit card, well, how do you participate? You can't yeah. take that Uber ride that maybe costs you less money or you can't uh, you know, engage in you know, sort of whatever uh, you know, interesting new services are, are being built. You yeah. can't engage in that. And so I think there's a massive opportunity to go get billions of people uh, into the digital economy that, that currently are locked out because they don't even have access yeah. to basic financial services. Yeah, I mean, in Africa, they're doing really interesting things with M-Pesa, for example, where you're using your mobile phone, which essentially becomes like your bank account. You, you top up on your... On, mm -hmm. your, on your phone account as a, as a essentially a, 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 you know, a place to keep credit. Do you think that you guys would, is, is, is PayPal's idea to integrate with more of those localized services, or would you ever try to build something of that yourselves or buy one of those? I mean, we, all of the above. Uh, okay. So like m specifically, for example, you know, we have a partnership with them. Uh, you know, You're partnered with them now. That, Do you that's think right. you might ever try to buy them? Um, you know, <laughs> I, I can't comment on something that, uh, yeah. uh, you know, it hasn't happened. Um, but, you know, we certainly don't need to buy, um, you know, to go partner well. I mean, that's one of the things that uh, I think is also uh, quite different about the PayPal of today versus the PayPal of, you know, a decade ago is that in opening up our platform uh, and saying, you know, we're a platform-based company, we want to partner with others. And so it's not just companies like Impesa that we've worked with. You know, we're working with local players and markets all over the world. Yeah. Sometimes those local players are tech companies, um, you know, like what we're doing with, you know, Ali uh, in, in China, uh, or, you know, working with banks and card networks and, and more traditional players. And so what we're really trying to do is, is make our platform an entry point for others to participate in the digital economy, whether you're a traditional player like a, you know, a bank or a card network, or if you're a startup trying to build the next thing, uh, or if you're a local player that's figured out something about the sort of FinTech ecosystem in your country, all of those are places where we want to go be an enabler of, of, of those different services. And I mean, from our perspective, the, there, there's such a sort of rapid development of new sort of payment methods and there's, it's such a diverse landscape, and the sort of the most important thing for us is to make sure that our merchants can capture whatever type of payment there is. And yeah. uh, so we, you know, from our perspective, go integrate is probably, you know, our core objective, or as it yeah. has been over the last eight years. How um, how has that been going? No, I know that still the bread and butter of iSettle is still the the card payments at point yeah. of sale in a physical place. I know you guys launched um. 
something for online payments about a year ago, maybe. How, how, and you do all their financial services like PayPal does as well, whether yeah. it's financing and other things. How, how much of that has worked out for you guys so far? Or are you still majority point of sale? Uh, from, from a sort of revenue perspective, ISL is still sort of majority, uh, for the, the re majority of revenues comes from payments. But I mean, we've been on a journey for, for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, even though we're perceived as a payments company, I mean, what we really offer is uh, a commerce platform for small yeah. businesses to be able to grow their business to the next point where they can employ that second person or you know expand. Um, so I think even though sort of revenues do not sort of uh, correlate, we see you know really strong pickup of of, uh, of the different services mm -hmm. that we offer in a more complex landscape for small merchants where you know they keep competing with the with the giants. They need yeah. to be able to run their business offline and online, and then who handles inventory? If you're only one person, then creates complexities, and those are the things that we're trying to solve. Okay. Say that we're, I'm going to switch, switch the gears a little, um, <laughs> because I feel like the biggest thing I've heard about people talk about in fintech, actually, in the last couple of years has been uh, cryptocurrency and the blockchain. I'm so <laughs> sorry to mention them. Yeah. I'm a skeptic myself, um, yeah. but I try to keep an open mind. Um, <laughs> what are you guys, where, what's, first of all, what's PayPal doing? on this front? What do you guys? You know, we, we certainly stay close to it. Um, you know, and uh, we've experimented with the technology a good bit. You know, as, as an engineer, I can appreciate the computer science breakthrough that blockchain represents. Not um, smoke and mirrors? <laughs> um, it is smoke and mirrors, just a little bit, yeah. isn't it? The, yeah. The, 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 <laughs> uh, Sorry. I think the thing that has yet to happen, you know, the, the real breakthrough of blockchain is this notion of distributed trust. And while that's a major breakthrough, there just aren't a lot of analogs to that uh, for, for people to look at and say, well, how would you operate something in a sort of fully decentralized trust model? And I think a lot of the early cycles uh, with blockchain have been people trying to go replace well-functioning central brokerages of trust with a distributed system. I think the bigger breakthroughs are going to happen when people start to apply that technology to problems that could only be solved through distributed trust. Right. I think the reason that's been a little slow going is, as I said, people don't have great analogs for that. Like, there's not a great you know, framework for like, oh, I see 100 different problems that are well solved by decentralized trust because it yeah. was a previously unsolved problem. Like, that was the brain yeah. teaser in, I mean, in school. Like, it I, wasn't solved before. I mean, wouldn't, isn't PayPal almost like the you know, counterpoint to it? It's like, why do we need that? We have PayPal. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, isn't that isn't that what you would say? Because I mean, you guys have already built rails that you would you would consider secure. It's not like people are constantly defrauding each other on your network, are they? Well, I mean, or are they? Certainly, a big part of our value. <laughs> well, a big part of our value prop is yeah. that we broker trust. Right. Uh, we we provide buyer exactly. protection. We provide seller protection. Right. So certainly, we do a lot to fight fraud, but we also guarantee both sides of the transaction uh, through, through buyer protection and seller protection, that is certainly a lot of what we do. Um, at the same time, you know, a lot of people will ask us like, well, does that mean that you know, it's a threat to you? And, and I look at it and say, you know, anything that helps to bring you know, more innovation sure. is, is something we want to get behind and that we want to encourage. Yeah. And like I said, I, I just think that um, it's going to take more experimentation for people to find the right problems to apply that technology to. I think that technology being applied to some problems that maybe it's not as well suited for, but as you find problems that could only be solved through decentralized right. trust, then I think you'll see some much more interesting use cases. Okay, on. now, sorry, Jacob, I'm gonna ask you a question, but are you guys trying to find those problems yourselves? We, Where are you sitting in the blockchain stuff? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we certainly look at some of those, um, and I think there are interesting examples of, you know, any, any place where there's not a well-functioning central brokerage, I think are interesting places to go apply the technology. So um, cross-border uh, currency swaps are a good example. You know, if we're gonna go swap dollars to euros, you can do that in milliseconds at a super low cost, right? Um, but say you want to go swap, you know, Kenyan currency to Nigerian currency, you know, that's gonna take, you know, many, many days 
and you're going to pay a very high fee to go do that because you don't have great functioning central brokerages there. So right. there's some companies out there that are doing exactly that kind of thing to say, oh, well, what if you use you know, cryptocurrency to go make those currency swaps instead of going through a central brokerage? And they're taking seven or eight minutes on the blockchain to settle is way better than the three days it might have taken otherwise. But I think you've got, that's a good example of where you need the right use case Kenyan currency to Nigerian currency, great use case. Yeah. Dollars to euros, maybe not as much because right. you can settle much faster than what the blockchain could do. Okay, so you guys, if, if PayPal were to move into something in a blockchain-based solution, it may be in an area like that, either getting behind one of these companies or launching a service like that first, rather than um, just, I don't know, something else that's more you know, within the US or something, you know, yeah, buying a, products on the blockchain Yeah, or as something. a basic transaction processing system, yeah. you know, uh, you know, it's a public ledger. You know, Bitcoin, for example, is a public ledger. Uh, you know, taking seven or eight minutes to go settle in the world of transaction processing where things happen in milliseconds, it's not a replacement for that kind of transaction yeah. processing. But like in that currency swap example, I do think there's other things that it can yeah. work well for, and we're definitely staying close to those. Okay. Jacob, did you want to add something to that? And then I have another question for you on this to follow up on. No, I Will mean, you from, guys, have you from, guys from been our perspective, I mean, we, we just try to, to uh, deliver to, to our merchants what they're looking for and sort of the most uh, frequently used sort of, uh, okay. payment methods and, and uh, sort of Bitcoin so, up until now has not been one of them. Right, so yeah. that, that was the second part of it all, of course, is you've got the blockchain, which can be, is, is a kind of distributed architecture, but then you've got the cryptocurrencies yeah. that sit on top of it. How much have you had merchants on the iSettle platform, start asking if they can take payments in Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever? Well, I mean, we, we were looking into sort of adding that as a payment Settle method. Coin. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> adding that as a payment method a couple of years ago. Then the fluctuation, obviously, of, of, of uh, the cryptocurrencies and uh, sort of there, there's really no demand from, from sort of offline merchants. Yeah. Right. At least they're selling sort of coffee to, to get paid with Bitcoin. So. Yeah. yeah. From that perspective, we haven't done much. But as you said, Bill, uh, you know, w where it becomes interesting maybe for us is more so uh, from a back-end perspective. If we can yeah. sort of replace some internal systems with sort of blockchain, that, that could make sense. Yeah. But that's yeah. as far as we've pushed it internally. Yeah. What about you guys? I mean, are, are we going to see a Venmo coin coming out soon or anything? <laughs> no, 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 we're, we're not. <laughs> so uh, silly. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, you know, You're we, a big fan, obviously. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, Huge. We, <laughs> as Jacob was saying, we, we, fo we follow user demand. And you know, we, we, we were accepting Bitcoin for a while. And as Jacob said, you, you know, were doing what for a while? We were accepting Bitcoin for a while. You were accepting, while, yeah. Um, uh, with Braintree. And it, it, you know, I, I think the you know, the consumer demand's not there for that, but as, as Jacob was mentioning, we see a lot of consumer demand for alternative payment methods. And so, for example, like we recently launched Smart Payment Buttons, which is democratizing access in the world of e-commerce uh, for small businesses all the way to large businesses yeah. to get to whatever form of payment somebody wants to pay with. And so if that does yeah. become something that you start to see the consumer demand, we've created a, a scalable infrastructure where a merchant can easily say, oh, well, flip that on for me, and the merchant's not doing a new integration to go add you know, a locally relevant payment method to go into a new yeah. market, or as consumers change their preferences to go add whatever consumers are, are Nicely preferring Nicely converted with. the question there, Bill. <laughs> but just to bring it back to the cryptocurrency, <laughs> I think that's really important, by the way, what you've just described. Yeah. It's, a, it's so fragmented. I mean, it's, yeah. once you start looking at payments globally, it's mm. like really surprising because I think people just you need, think that cards, if you live in the West somewhere, you assume <clears throat> card, card payments, whether it's debit or credit, is, is all that's needed, but it's really not even That's exactly what we surface. realized over the last couple of years from yeah. our perspective, that you know, when we started, I think the, the payment landscape was actually a lot easier for merchants to, to yeah. be dealing yeah. with. It was basically MasterCard, Visa, and American Express from a card payment perspective, and then PayPal. But now the, the, you know, the multitude of payment options yeah. you know, in, in the Nordics with Swish, Vips, Mobile Pay, yeah. you know, these bank-to-bank -bank transfer Absolutely. schemes that's really you know, escalating really fast. Yeah. You know, the demand for those types of um, payment solutions to be accepted at point of sales is much, much higher compared yeah. to crypto. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so no, 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 no driver yet to try to create your own cryptocurrency or start taking oh. some of the, the, the more popular ones. 
Not from us, no. From, uh, from merchants or buyer uh, consumers or anything like that? No, I mean, yeah. just the... Um, if you do you look think at, it's... Uh, let, me, let me put it differently, because I've already asked you this question, yeah. but do you think it's um, a healthy market right now? Well, I mean, you certainly see that um, some of what's out there is speculation yeah. uh, on the currency. So you got to, I'm certainly not the only one to say this, lots of folks have talked about this, uh, sort of separating out the technology from the currency. Yeah. I think the technology, there's a lot of interesting things that will happen. Yeah. Um, as I was saying before, you just need to apply the technology to the problems that are best suited for it. Yeah. I think on the currency side, you know, uh, there's certainly been a lot of people that are engaging in currency speculation there, which... I don't know that that's a healthy thing, which is why we've chosen not to really participate in that aspect yeah. of it. Um, uh, but that doesn't mean that we're not paying very close attention to the technology uh, and, and, and what could be there. And even the things I was mentioning, you know, part of, part of you know, what you do as, a, as an innovator is be prepared to adapt as yeah. things evolve. And so, like I mentioned on smart payment buttons, like there's a bunch of things like that that we're doing to say, well, hey, we know we can't perfectly predict. Yeah. We want to be flexible such that we're prepared for the fact that you can't perfectly predict how yeah. markets evolve, but that we can be flexible and adaptive as, as markets evolve. Which is a great thing to say because that segues into my next question. I wanted to ask you guys what you thought about Amazon's cashierless stores. Do you think that that's something that could actually become ubiquitous, or do you think it's a marketing stunt by Amazon? And if well, it's ubiquitous, uh, do you, how will you adapt to that one? Well, I, I think it's an interesting experiment. I think it, it, it will, you know, eventually we'll see whether it's something that, that actually works. But I, my personal view is that we'll see some sort of hybrid of the yeah. sort of completely um, sort of digitized offline retail store and, and someone with actual people selling things in it. But you know, the transformation of retail right now is, is crazy and a lot of, sort of retailers are really feeling the, yeah. the, the, the stress of Amazon and, and the likes. I think that's right. I think in the world of retail, you, know, you see it every day with stores closing, going bankrupt. These kinds of there's going to be more change in the world of retail in the next five years than there's oh. been in the last 50. And I think the question really is, as those retailers work to adapt, um, you know, how do you go give them access to the kinds of tools that previously had been reserved yeah. only for the largest few? And I think yeah. that's a really important thing that you know, we endeavor to go do, that we want to go give access to the many uh, to engage in those kind of capabilities. But I think that's going to be a very important theme across the industry for the next 10 years, is how do you make it so that many players get to participate in that versus only a privileged few having access to those kinds yeah. of capabilities. That's always, that's always the theme, isn't it? And to yeah. summarize, yeah. that's sort of the, the whole logic behind yeah. the two yeah. of us sitting here together. So. Exactly right. Yeah, But does that mean that you guys are working on cashless now? <laughs> well, we're, we're, uh, we, we, certainly care, we certainly care a lot about, <laughs> yeah. you know, innovation in the store. We see that blurring yeah. together. We see that, you know, a lot of what we're doing with mobile payments, uh, you know, like this past Black Friday, for the first time, we had over a billion dollars in mobile payment volume in a single day. Yeah. Then cross that again on Cyber Monday. But that's a great example of how you see the digital world and the physical world really starting mm -hmm. to come together. The Black Friday that used to be a completely physical world event now is as much about digital as it Absolutely. is about in store, but those yeah. are merging together. So that's a big focus for us, and that is, as Jacob was saying, a, you know, a primary driver of us working together is to say, we want to combine those digital capabilities with great yeah. in-store capabilities like what Jacob and his team have been working on. Okay, we're out of time, but thank you so Excellent. much, you guys. Thank, thank, you. thank you all. Thank Thanks, you. everybody.